Great, I will start us off. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day two of MPC Nights 2021, our three-day online conference. I'm Angela Kale, Director of Consulting here at MPC, and I'm very pleased to be chairing today's session. Yesterday, we had a brilliant opener to the conference with the excellent Professor Sir Michael Marmot, giving a sobering account of the state of health inequalities, but also an encouragement that we, should, that we already have evidence-based recommendations, so we should continue to stay optimistic and continue with the great work that we are doing. That was echoed in our session on the environment, where the need for change is great, and Kirsty McNeil talked about the work that Save the Children have been doing, and Polly Billington talked about the need for greater cooperation in this area. We then had Danny Kruger talking about the need for social aspects of levelling up, which tied nicely in with our last session on levelling up, where the panel talked about the need for the levelling up agenda to be seized on a local and regional level. This morning, I hope you managed to attend one of our excellent breakouts or speak to one of our consultants. And this afternoon, we have an exciting agenda planned. Having concentrated yesterday on some of the big issues affecting society, today we are moving our attention more towards our own sector. We will be reflecting on how the social sector responded, adapted and innovated through the pandemic and what lessons we can learn for the next big crisis. We will be exploring the role of the social sector in shaping the policies of today's government, and we will be discussing the role of data in helping us to respond to changing circumstances. We have a great lineup of speakers talking with us today. My MPC colleagues are here to help. So if any questions throughout the day, do either contact them on the chat, or email events at thinkmpc.org and they will do their best to help. We are of course on social media, so do join the discussion there using the hashtag MPC Ignites. And we are a charity that relies on the generosity of donors to help us provide our support for the sector. And we are really grateful for all who support us. In particular, today I'd like to thank Coopsis, our event sponsor, and Barra Cadbury Trust for supporting our bursary scheme for MPC Ignites, allowing so many small charities to be with us today. And my last housekeeping is to remind us all that this event has been recorded and that journalists are present. So I'm excited to introduce our speaker, Dan Corey, who became Chief Executive just before our 2011 conference, following a variety of posts in public policy and economics. He was head of the number 10 policy unit and senior advisor to the Prime Minister on the economy from 2007 to 2010. As well as leading MPC, he is a trustee of St Mungo's, 19 Princelet Street and of the What Work Centre for Wellbeing. He is a former member of the Research Committee of the ESRC and of the Greater Manchester Economic Advisory Panel. Dan is going to speak now about the future of the social sector where he sees the challenges have been for the sector and our thinking from MPC's Rethink Rebuild work about how we can rise to meet these challenges. Dan, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Angela, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to be talking to you again. Um, I'm gonna have some slides, which I'm gonna be helped with um, uh, by uh, Gillian. Uh, so we've got the first slide up there. And let, and let me begin. Um, slide one, please. Back to slide one. Thank you. COVID has been awful for so many at a personal level and at a national level, but it's also been a time of great change and not all of those changes have been for the worst. I'm going to talk about some of what happened during COVID, about the inequality it exposed, how our sector responded, and what we and the government need to do to make the best possible impact for people as we emerge from the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. We know that COVID exposed many inequalities, inequalities that was always there, as did the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement in the wake of the terrible events in the USA. Sadly, these inequalities showed up very clearly in the figures for deaths from COVID, something which Sir Michael Marmot talked about yesterday. During the first wave, the ONS says the rate of death involving COVID was highest for the Black African group, almost four times greater than for the white British group for males and two and a half times greater for females. 
with high rates for many other minority ethnic groups. In terms of deprivation, analysis of ONS figures shows that from March 2020 to April 2021, those living in the bottom decile areas in terms of deprivation had a death rate from COVID two and a half times higher than the least deprived decile. In the second wave, even after adjustments for location, disadvantage and so on, most Black and South Asian groups remained at higher risk than white British people. Those figures on deaths are stark, but it goes further and it will last for longer. Because as the recent Health Foundation COVID inquiry pointed out, lockdowns, though necessary, have had it added to inequality as they have wide ranging consequences from unmet health needs and mental health problems to education gaps, lost employment and financial security. Next slide, please. Our sector has done its very best in difficult circumstances, and we've shown just how important we are to society during COVID. It's been impressive. So many did so much. There are so many examples, but this slide just shows just a little bit of it. The bigger charities did some amazing work. The Trussell Trust delivered a major increase in emergency food parcels, a crucial lifeline for so many families and individuals. The British Red Cross was crucial in its work, for instance, helping out with its assisted discharge service, and so supporting around 100 hospitals across the country. And many, many smaller charities did great work too. An example that I've got on the slide here is the Rainbow Alliance in Solihull, which helped an estimated 12,000 people in the area with free care packages to people who were isolated because of COVID or had reduced incomes or exp experiencing difficulties purchasing food. Many, many others were doing the same. And next slide, please. We all remember the fantastic responses in terms of volunteering and the setting up of mutual aid groups and so on as COVID erupted. Many people went above and beyond. It was uplifting. It certainly felt like there was a lot more volunteering, TV coverage of it and of mutual aid groups and NHS volunteers. But it's actually not that clear from the latest NOH ONS statistics from the Community Living Survey that this is representative of what actually happened. Contrary to what might, one might think, formal volunteering has been falling since 2013-14, and it dropped sharply in 2020-21. Now that may be surprising at first glance, but maybe not so much given the lockdown and COVID nervousness. Perhaps it is also not surprising that participation in formal volunteering, at least once in the last 12 months, was quite a bit higher in the least deprived areas at 38% than in the most deprived areas at 22%. This difference and the presence of charities in more prosperous areas is something we've highlighted before. It is troubling and very relevant to the current levelling up agenda. On the other hand, and again, perhaps not surprising when you think about it, informal, unstructured volunteering, which is defined as giving unpaid help to individuals who are not a relative, went up a bit, especially for those doing it once a month, where it went from 28% in 2019-20 to 33% in 2020-21. And then you put all that together and you can see these aggregate volunteering trends in the graph. Next slide, please. Similarly, trying to work out what state the sector is really in is hard to do at the moment. It is difficult to tell from failure or income data as yet, although academics are looking at this. Hard data is very lagged. Even the new NCBO Almanac only really covers financial data from 2018-19. So it doesn't really tell us what's going on today. We know, though, that those reliant on major public fundraising through in-person events or income from charity shops were badly hit at the start. Those reliant on social enterprise activities like cafes or paid for training courses were also deeply affected by the lockdowns. On the other hand, those with grants or contracts did rather better on average. What about smaller charities? Again, we have a dearth of hard data, but evidence from previous recessions is that they tend not to close at this point in the cycle, but try to keep going. The damage caused will only become clearer as the COVID tide goes out again. Some say there were very big drops in income, mainly using self-selection surveys to try and assess this. For instance, Pro Bono Economics in June 2020 predicted a massive drop of 6.4 billion in income over the six months to December 2020 and said one in 10 charities were potentially facing bankruptcy. But there is evidence the other way. CAF's UK Giving Report 2020 said donation levels in the first half of 2020 were actually up on the previous year by some 800 million. Cathy Farrow of the Centre for Charitable Giving and Philanthropy has tried to square the circle a bit by pointing to new charities cropping up during COVID, new online approaches to donation, 
I'm sure you'll remember Captain Tom. And more publicity, for instance, for local food banks that encourage more donations. But certainly, even if the aggregate amount of giving did not change, there may have been big distributional changes as people wanted to fund very frontline COVID-related charities. And that will have hurt you if you were at the wrong end of that trend. Meanwhile, a recent report on charity shops conducted for Charity Finance magazine suggests that much of the losses made due to the closure of charity shops was made up through furlough and other COVID emergency measures and support. And though not enough for many, the government did cough up £750 million to the sector, as well as other sums that helped some charities through support to the cultural and heritage sectors. Perhaps of more concern is what's left in reserves. The Charity Commission recently reported that the number of charities with an annual income of more than £500,000 that had no or negative free reserves had increased from 9% in April 2020 to 28% in July this year. A very big increase indeed. No doubt many smaller charities below that threshold are also facing very difficult times. Next slide, please. One thing we might hope would be happening as a result of all this new focus on inequality is that funders have got the message and started to focus more on equality issues. New NPC analysis of the grant nav data that that's linked with 360 giving looked at those grants that mentioned that mentioned diversity, inequality or inclusion in the description field. And it shows that in England, the proportion of grants citing these issues appears to be up from 0.3% in 2019 to 4.4% so far this year. While the data and our analysis of it is very far from perfect and there are many health warnings to it, I think this is an interesting and encouraging. And as you can see from the graph, it was the case for most regions of England. We will want to keep an eye on these trends. So a lot of good things, but we must be ambitious to do better. And we really are at NPC. We think the sector can do better. And that's not just about money. Impact, achieving things, comes too low down the list of what charities and funders are all about. If we could improve just a bit, we could do so much more. Imagine the 163,000 charities, let alone all the social enterprises and community groups, each just helping, on average, one more person because of more effective use of their resources. That would lead to thousands more being helped. And because of the people our sector mainly works with, that would be thousands of those most in need. Of course, this is not the way the world works, but it gives a feel of why we must strive to do better. It's often not our sector's fault. A lot is about the pressures the sector faces, especially as regards funding, the need to compete, to get profile, to keep supporters and trustees happy, it takes one's eye off the point of it all, having an impact and making people's lives better. A lack of accountability, of metrics, of reporting on impact, even more so for grant makers, adds to an environment that pushes us away from focusing on our impact, both as individual organizations and collectively. So can we put some of these behaviors right? Next slide, please. We have put on the table many things over recent years to increase the impact of the sector, both at an individual charity level and as a sector, using theories of change, using metrics and data, urging changes to regulation and reporting, pushing a focus on deprivation and where charities are located and where they are most needed. And we've recently added a strong diversity lens too. And some of the things emerging from COVID, including the use of digital technology and more collaboration, echo areas we have always pushed on. We want to hold on to them and do more of them. And we brought some of this latter thinking into our Rethink Rebuild work with five main strands. It's worth a look. I'll just say a little bit about it. First, we need shared strategies to solve issues. We can't solve big problems alone. A housing provider, for example, is not going to solve homelessness by themselves because they also need to solve mental health issues, substance misuse, family breakdown, domestic violence, employability, and so on. So it makes sense to work with others. This working together needs to be hardwired into everything we do and needs funding to allow that. Second, we need to make collaboration work and work for all, and that includes bigger organisations with smaller ones. Often the best insights come from those working directly on the front line. But these charities are often smaller and lack the resources to be able to throw their weight around when working alongside much bigger charities. It's easy to see how this relationship can go wrong. What can we do about that? We're trying to find out. Third, we need different approaches to funding. COVID saw more unrestricted funding delivered faster in a less bureaucratic way. That's good. 
very good. Let's keep it. But let's not get carried away and think that these trust-based approaches mean being evidence-free. If you really want to help the beneficiaries the best you can, you still need to understand your impact. How we go about this impact assessment and measurement needs to evolve, but the basic need remains. Fourth, we need to collect, synthesize, and use data of all kinds. We need data, and we need to be able to share the data and to share the intelligence that we gather. And that includes government data. That would allow us to direct the right services to the right people at the right time. We need shared intelligence that combines official government data with real-time, often qualitative insights from charities and businesses. Charities can provide the cold face view that high-level statistics too often fail to capture. And last, we need to be seen as a genuine partner by government at all levels. We need to be influencing policy aims and the choice of options to achieve them. We need to be taken seriously by policymakers at national and local levels, be this on health reform, levelling up, offender rehabilitation, youth employability, loneliness, social care or climate change. We have so much to offer. But to do this, we need to marshal our arguments, bring together powerful evidence, come up with practical solutions and show that we really do speak for many, often the most vulnerable, and are not just a bunch of complainers. We also need collectively to do the best job we can of showing our relevance to government as it develops its plans on how we rebuild the country as we recover from the shocks of the COVID pandemic. We need to move fast and we shouldn't move, miss this window of opportunity to show the many ways we are not just nice to have, but absolutely necessary to recovery. And without giving up anyone's beliefs or passion, we need to have some sensitivity to the politics of the time. It always takes two to tango and we need to play our role too. These are the things we want to work on and why we hope that many of you will want to join with us to further them. Now, some might say, can the sector change? It's never easy. There are lots of excuses not to, but being open about the challenges of sector is a very good start. Many of the shifts that happened due to COVID, whether it's more flexible funding or greater cross-sector collaboration or more use of data should be seized upon to rebuild the charity and philanthropy sector that we know we need. If we miss this opportunity, we're accepting a return to systemic failings that have needed to change for a long time. Last, uh, next slide, please. But importantly, the government needs to take change too if the sector is to be able to do its best. And that is surely something they should want. So I say to them, stop bearing down unnecessarily on campaigning. There are genuine worries in the sector currently around the police bill and the elections bill, around restrictions on judicial review, Plus, we have the lobbying act and gagging clauses around contracts. Give the sector a proper place in the heart of decision making. It's nothing against the new minister to say to government, you should not downgrade our voice with no dedicated minister, no office of civil society and tucked away in the wrong department. Civil society is at the heart of British life and it needs to be heard in Westminster and Whitehall. Please, please resist the temptation to have woke attacks on charities because it's politically useful in the short term. This will cause long-term damage to our pluralist democracy. And yes, support small local charities, but also recognize how important the bigger national ones are. Small charities need support, but for many problems, size really does matter. This sector, our sector, is crucial to solving so many of the wicked issues, climate crisis, social care, poverty, and inequity. So I say to the new Charities Minister, who we welcome warmly, to the Prime Minister, to the new levelling up Supremo Michael Gove, to the Health Secretary and to the COP26 President Alok Sharma, as well as to all the local leaders from Manchester to Essex, and from Cornwall to Aberdeen. Let's find ways to work together, because together we're so much stronger. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. That was a really excellent overview of both the, the challenges and the things that we can do to improve that sector. Obviously, MPC is at the heart of some of those efforts to improve. And I'm really pleased today to be able to say that after many fruitful and encouraging conversations about 2021, MPC has accepted an invitation to be in strategic partnership with the Equitable Evaluation Initiative based out of the US. My colleague James will be talking about that more in his session on impact measurement this afternoon. But in the meantime, if you would like to hear more about it, there should be a form in the chat to sign up. Dan, I think there probably are quite a lot of questions that we would like to ask you, particularly reflecting on what Danny Kruger said yesterday compared to what you've just said about campaigning. 
but I'm afraid I'm going to move on to our panel on lessons in, from the crisis that is also being shared by, chaired by me. So I'll say goodbye to you, Pat, uh, Dan, and welcome.